Thank you all for being here. I appreciate you being here this evening, spending your time um, with us, giving me a chance to talk to an audience in a town that has immense meaning to me. Um, I, I actually married a Glassboro native. Glen, of Glen Lake Boulevard, 1304. She's sitting in the middle over here. She can raise her hand and wave. There you go. That's why I'm here. That's like, when, I've, I've been fortunate to receive you know, some invitations to talk for many decades in this business, and it's been great. Um, some of them I turn down and some of them I accept, which is a wonderful position to be in. Um, but when it, the subject line came from uh, Professor Kerrigan that said Rowan in it, it was like, okay, this one I don't get to dodge. Because next to my wife is sitting, her brother and her sister, all the natives have regathered here in Glassboro. They all grew up here, went off and got their doctorates, went to careers, lived around the country, around the world, do other things, and they're back in Glassboro. So I actually feel like I'm not really the center of the show at all. But it's wonderful to have people paying attention to me rather than to them, because they've spent the last couple of days here, you know, seeing all kinds of people. In they're, they're also the children of a very distinguished uh, alumnus here, uh, Marvin Creamer, who helped to uh, organize and manage and run the geography department, the social sciences program um, for 29 years from 1948 to 1977, and is also one of the world's most famous sailors. But I don't really want to go into all the gory details. Of you can see the memorial to him uh, endurance out in the back behind the library um, and, and next to Robinson Hall, if you're curious who my father-in-law was. I was a very lucky man to marry into that family. Uh, and so here I am in Glassboro, which is wonderful. Uh, but today, uh, what, I'm, what I'm here to talk about is, um, has to do with President's Day. And the President's Day always uh, raises a question for us, right, about whether or not uh, the times make the person or the person makes the times. This is an enduring historical problem of, of agency, as we sometimes like to call it. And one of the best ways to think about this problem is provided by Karl Marx, who was, you know, regardless of what you think of his politics and predictions and revolutionary enthusiasms, was a brilliant historical sociologist, uh, among other things. And as he put it, he said, people make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered given and transmitted from the past. We're not independent agents, right? So we have to understand the context. And in order to understand John Kennedy and his relationship to Africa, to the liberation of Africa, to the creation of independent states there, we need to consider his circumstances. Uh, and it's, so first we need to understand the time frame here. And that's the Cold War. And the Cold War is, for historians, is a historical period that, that maybe should be understood primarily in terms of imperialism and colonialism. What would replace the European-dominated system of colonial empires after World War I, but particularly after World War II? Uh, this is a competition between you know, the free trading, free market, private property, democracy claiming, relatively democratic, American style of liberal capitalism on the one hand versus the if you will, the sort of uh, command economy centered socialist vision of greater equality of distribution of goods with less emphasis on pure production, which is kind of what the capitalists specialize in. And that's really what the big competition is in the Cold War from the, the broadest perspective. But of course, most Americans didn't see it that way. Most Americans at the time in the Cold War saw it in terms of pretty basic things like freedom versus slavery. Right. And especially because the Soviet side in the Cold War, the Soviet-led side, was busy doing things like building the Berlin Wall. And any country that builds walls to keep people in seemed uh, pretty obviously problematic to Americans in really dramatic ways. In fact, it was very much framed as a, 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 an a, a competition between good and evil. The moralism involved is difficult for Americans in 2024 to recapture with our own anxieties about our place in the world today, our uncertainties about our moral rightness, a deep uncertainties about what we've been doing in places like Iraq for a long time. This was very different in the Cold War, especially in the early Cold War years. Uh, instead, what you can see again in this map is not, did, not only were the Soviets and their communist allies seen as building walls to keep their people in, oppressing them, et cetera, but also expanding outward in this dramatic sort of fashion. So Americans in this period were therefore um, shedding very fast their old-fashioned neutrality, which had been the standard American approach to great power conflicts uh, ever since set the 1770s, and since the American independence by 1783. Uh, and the US attitude toward Europeans and towards great power conflicts is that these are evil people who send their working young men out to kill and die um, for purposes that have nothing to do with the benefit to their lives. Americans thought this was just uh, that the Europeans were slaughterhouse empires, almost. Uh, and 
the only reasonable response to that, especially for Christian Americans up through World War I, was to stay out of these wars. I mean, neutrality was a virtuous position, which is very hard for Americans after the Cold War begins to reclaim. Because by then, everything looks black and white to Americans. And being neutral when things are black and white, that means you're asleep. It means you're morally dead. Uh, and Americans found that to be a, an unacceptable position. But the problem is, of course, that the Cold War, the same period from 1945, roughly, up until 1990, roughly, uh, you know, this is the same period uh, that the world's majority of human beings and peoples are gaining their independence from imperial control. It's the denouement to a 500-year story of trying to get out from under European-dominated uh, forms of colonialism and imperialism. Uh, this had started much earlier, of course. I mean, the, the United States, we sometimes forget, was the great model to the rest of the world of how to declare independence from and fight your way free from an overseas European colonial empire. The U.S. was the model. This is why people like Ho Chi Minh quote uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson, quote the Declaration of Independence when they declare their own independence in Vietnam in 1945. Uh, this is an enduring, powerful thing that Americans should not forget. Uh, this is a story of unfolding independence across the world from European control that continues for the next 50 years after 1776. In Latin America, where you see independence um, coming to, uh, to, to fruition everywhere, including eventually Cuba and, and Brazil, which are a couple of the later ones, um, but coming through there. And then you can see the campaign continues, this, this struggle for liberation from overseas Europe European control continues after World War I with the, the demise of the Ottoman Empire and the liberation of the Middle Eastern states into what looks like the map you're used to today when you see Americans serving in Syria or Jordan or uh, Iraq. This is where it comes from. It's from the 1918 to 1923 period. And it's a, a, it's a, a pattern and a process of liberation that reaches its peak, its apex in the Cold War. So for most of the world, the Cold War wasn't about the Cold War. This period of time was about freedom, not American-style capitalist freedom. It was about getting literally free of an outside military forces that owned and operated the territory that you lived in and creating your own self-sustaining na nation states. That was really what the project was. This was also a, a racialized struggle because Europeans were coded as white, which is a problematic category, but I don't have time to get into uh, today. But, and the rest of the world was coded as not white, and therefore the racial element to this was longstanding. It had emerged in the 1500s with the transatlantic slave trade, and particularly um, with particular focus on en uh, enslaving African laborers uh, and sending them across the Atlantic. Um, but it carries on up to, to the end of apartheid in 1990 in South Africa. It's a, it's a 400 year struggle. And for most of the world's population, this is an amazing story of, of extreme difficulty and eventual success. And it happens during the Cold War. Uh, and for them, that's the real history. And Americans kind of miss this. The Soviets missed it, too. I mean, they each work on it. I'll, I'll be explaining exactly how they try to use it. But it's a story that makes uh, these years of 1945 up through 1990 look very different. Um, the third world nations, and that term third world emerges, the French, uh, French journalist first uses it in 1952, referring to the Tiers Monde. Uh, he means that the first world of the American-led capitalist sphere was competing against the Soviet-led communist sphere, and those countries beginning to gain their independence, starting with India and then Burma and the rest of the, the Southeast Asia, uh, eventually South Asian and on out to the rest of Asia and Africa, they emerge as a self-proclaimed third world. That's something they claim with great pride to say, we are not in your first world. We're not in your, this is your problem. This is your civil war in the northern hemisphere. And third world countries, wildly diverse across a wild, uh, wide spectrum, uh, have great differences with each other, great differences about whether or not to take on socialist approaches to building political economies or whether to, to take on uh, capitalist ones. They have different versions of what democracy is, but they share a disdain for anybody who's neutral on the question of national independence, right? Anybody who's neutral on imperialism is, is just unacceptable to them, exactly in the same way that nations that were, and peoples who were neutral on the issue of the Cold War of communism were seen as unacceptable to Americans, right? They had their own vision. And in fact, the CIA was quite clear about this. They, they uh, 
reminded the president in 1963 during Kennedy's presidency uh, that these anti-racists in Africa saw, as they put it, no room for non-alignment in this dispute. Right? So when John Foster Dulles in the 1950s, the Secretary of State before Kennedy under, under um, Dwight Eisenhower, when he's talking about what he referred to as, as neutrality in the third world for the Cold War as an immoral and short-sighted conception, African nationalists find that appalling, that sort of language, right? For them, it's like, wait a minute. The really appalling problem here at a moral level is your continued connivance with these first world nations who've had us under their imperial thumbs for so long. So the United States uh, has a particular challenge in this conflict, and you're gonna see this hopefully here in my little slide that makes me try to look like a social scientist briefly. If this is my effort to try to be cool like the political scientists. I hope they're in here because I'm always making, they're people I love and they're close to me. And, but I never do this sort of thing. This is my, my big effort. But what I'm trying to suggest here is the U.S. has a special challenge in the years from the 1940s to 1990s. That is that unlike the Soviet Union, the U.S. is a very demographically diverse place with a substantial black population and increasingly later in the Cold War an increasing Asian American population and Latino population and of course a Native American population. So it has a demographic diversity that's, uh, that's racialized and connected to the third world in all kinds of obvious ways. So this is a challenge to Americans in a way that the Soviets get a free hand on. Because there are not a lot of, of, of black Soviets. There are a few, and that's an interesting whole other issue. We could do a lecture on some other time. But in this case, the US has the big challenge. And this period from 1945 to, to 1989 is, uh, is one of great and immense change, but it's not a simple moral story. It's instead for the US this challenge of how to hold on to the first world, its historic allies, uh, of Britain and France particularly, and if you're following American Revolutionary War, you'll remember that France was the first great ally. You know. But they're all lined up in NATO by 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This is back when you know, NATO used to be like acceptable to both parties. I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't mention that. But you know, in, in other words, these are the great empires. They're, they're, on the, they're closely allied to the US as anti-communist powers. And they're wrestling with losing their empires exactly in these years. Meanwhile, the empires themselves down in the third world, a huge diverse category put together into a simple phrase with apologies because they're using it that way. You know, they're trying to decide which way they go. This is the American goal is how to pull them both, how to bend that historic north-south line of contention so that both sides of it go over to the western side. Before I did this slide, I used to have to do this like this, and I, it's terrible. I've made it real full. So now I think I'm a cool social scientist. I hope you guys appreciate it. But anyway, the, the point is the Soviets have a different version. I didn't make a slide of their, their version is they, they have no interest in the Northern European empires having lost a brief effort to have communist parties succeed in the 1946-47 elections in Belgium and France and Italy. Uh, they've sort of given up. Communism isn't going to work. The Americans have corrupted those people. That's essentially their view of it. Uh, and instead, they're, they're busy trying to pull the global south their way. And they get the first big victory, which is in China in 1945, from 45 to 49, that civil war that leads to the People's Republic of China, which is the largest and most significant third world country becoming a communist country, allied closely with the Soviet Union. So you can see this is, this is the struggle here. And uh, the, the State Department was pretty specific about this. Uh, they called this uh, in a reminder to the president. They said, this is in 1963, to Ken they're sending this note to Kennedy reminding him that the global U.S. strategy is one of fostering a cooperative community of free nations across the north-south dividing lines of race and wealth. That's what we have to do. We've got to win one side and win the other side. It's hard to do when those people hate each other. They don't all hate each other. Right? I mean, it's a complicated relationship in decolonization. It's a long, big struggle. But there's a lot of tension there, a lot of exploitation, a lot of inequality. And winning both sides of that is a, is a small, the odds of doing that are, are very, well, they're challenging, let's put it that way. And that, that's what the Americans are up to. And in terms of a time frame, at the very center of this period of the Cold War, trying to win this struggle for, the, for both the first world and the third world, is John Kennedy, he, because he comes into office in 1961, and he lasts before he's assassinated late in 1963 for two and a half years. And he is a, a, a cold warrior par excellence, but he also is an anti-colonialist, as we will see. So these 34 months of the Kennedy administration um, turn out to be have one of the greatest challenges uh, be the managing of the transition of Africa to independence. So we've got a time frame, and now we need a person, and that's this guy. Kennedy, well, they're I don't know how many books. 
I, last count I looked at was 40,000 books plus. So I've teased people, my friends, who are still writing books about Kennedy. I'm like, really? Do we need more of them? I mean, it's amazing. The obsession with Jack Kennedy in this country is appalling. It's, I mean, it's wonderful because, you know, all history is great. Like, I just, man, all the research out here, those of you who were able to be part of this poster session or came and listened, it's fantastic to see what people are working on. And Kennedy is interesting. He's very interesting. But we've really covered him pretty well. And I'm always amazed that, that people are still working on new, trying to dig up new stuff. And the reason they're doing it is partly because of this Camelot imagery that was built out of his assassination, the early death of the young president who was, among other things, young. And yes, I'm going to look around this crowd right now and I'm going to think about my age and your age. And most of you, well, he's elected at age, you know, he's 43, right? And, and it comes into president. He's the youngest person ever elected the presidency. Theodore Roosevelt briefly was president at a younger age because of an assassination of McKinley when he was vice president, he moved up. But Kennedy's the youngest one, and so you think he's old. I get that, I get that. But the rest of us think he was incredibly young. And Americans especially compared him to Dwight Eisenhower, who's 27 years older. And, you know, Eisenhower, famous for his golf swing, you know. Jack Kennedy was a better golfer. But of course, he never let cameras catch him on a golf course. No way, because he was the active guy. The Kennedys were the touch football people, remember? Right there, they were, they, so they were going to be associated with the old. So it's a new generation. That's the thing about, about Kennedy. It's, it's youthfulness. It's also, he's handsome. I mean, I don't know how this works in this culture anymore, because what ideas of handsomeness are, I don't know. But compared to previous presidents, he was shockingly handsome. Uh, and, 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 and I don't know what people think about Jackie Kennedy anymore, but she was shockingly beautiful or attractive by typical standards of the time. She's also 12 years younger than him. I mean, he was young and she was really young. She's 31, right, when he's 43. So, you know, and she, you can see they're um, glamorous. They dress well, they're, they're extremely wealthy. I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, but they're also, they're also family people. They have kids, they've got kids in the White House running around. This is Carolyn, their oldest one, who's uh, six months older than me, you know, so uh, we were pretty identified, you know, the Kennedy kids when we were kids. It was amazing to have little children. And so they seemed like a, a new generation in a very exciting way. Um, but of course, the other reason is just that he dies in office. He, and in a shocking way, that assassination. Nowadays, we sort of think it's normal for people to assassinate other people. It's become such a normal part of American and international culture. But in 1963, this, this was an amazing thing. It wasn't new, unique. There was Lincoln. There were other people, Garfield at the rest. But the Kennedy one really stunned people because he seemed so youthful and vibrant. And to lose him was something that people really wrestled with. And of course, you could see it in the polls. A Kennedy won the popular vote in 1960 by less than 1%, but they did polling in the months after his assassination, and two-thirds of Americans claimed that they voted for Kennedy. You know, I mean, there's, there's, which just tells you, you, just, you can see the process flip over about how he was seen. Now, uh, historians are a skeptical crowd, and so we, of course, do have an anti-Camelot historiographical wave that follows that, which emphasizes his risk-taking, his infidelity above all else in his marriage, his spectacular, what they called womanizing at the time. I mean, he was, he was uh, uh, risk-taking to an extreme extent in that regard, and some of this had to do with another piece of what's come out about Kennedy is the, is the extent to which he had really poor health behind that image of vitality. This was a person who was, um, who suffered, uh, he always thought he was going to die young. He suffered from, among other things, scarlet fever, uh, malaria, osteoporosis, and Addison's disease. He spent a lot of time on crutches as president. They hid it very carefully and very well, though it was tougher than it was with FDR and hiding the wheelchair. Right, because those cameras had come in, those television cameras in the 1950s, and especially by the early 60s. Uh, he lived on a cocktail, of, when he's president, a cocktail of pharmaceutical products that scared the bejesus out of, if you'll pardon the phrase, uh, out of his, uh, many of his assistants. They weren't sure exactly what was being combined, but he said it kept him alive. He had a position that some people thought was a quack. And it's just an amazing, complicated set of stories that people write these 40,000 books about, about Jack Kennedy. But he also was a person who was, um, who had, was familiar with tragedy. I mean, his older brother is killed, uh, you know, as a, a bomber pilot in World War II. His uh, older sister, Kick, Kathleen, uh, the newest Kick, uh, dies in a plane crash four years later, 1948. Uh, another older sister had been lobotomized after being, she was cognitively uh, disabled and uh, went through a lobotomy that wound up putting her in an institution. He spent a lot of time in bed as a kid, you know, from his own health thing. So Kennedy was a person both of great privilege and, and immense uh, familiarity with tragedy which makes him interesting you know, to a lot of us, not just to historians. I mean, it's just, he, he, was, he, had le he did a lot in this life. But for our purposes, the thing I want to emphasize about him is that he was modern. 
1960, he was modern. And what that meant was he looked good on TV. He was cool under pressure, very cool under pressure. He was witty. He was self-deprecating. He made fun of himself nicely. Uh, and he was very, he was, he was very clever. Uh, he was complimentary to other people. He was attentive to little kids. Uh, it, was, it was amazing sometimes to see him. He was, having had a, a, a sister who was disabled, he, he would get down, you know, squat down and deal with little kids at a really personal level. And it sort of amazed people because he seemed like sort of a tough guy in other, in other ways. Uh, he was charismatic, really. But the most distinctive part of his modernity, his modernness, for us, is that he was also essentially non-racist, or at least as non-racist as you could be. Not because he was familiar with black folks, because he grew up wealthy in Massachusetts, and the only black person he'd spent a lot of time with was George Thomas, his personal valet, who he was very close with. Um, but it was, as James Meredith, one of the key civil rights workers in early 1960s uh, Mississippi, he, he referred to Kennedy as the first president who was not a racist. He meant that in just personal terms, how he managed people, how comfortable he was with people who were not of European descent. And you see that in some of the images that I'll have here for him. But he is, he, despite this, he comes out of a family of background that of, of tremendous wealth, on, uh, especially on his dad's side, um, the Kennedys, and of, and of political heritage on both his father, Joseph, and his mother, Rose's sides, uh, political families. Um, there's great privilege there. He kind of misses the Depression. I mean, he's born in 1917. So the middle of the Depression, he's in his teenage years. Right, so, but the Depression, you know, kind of, phew, Misses. Here's how you can know this. When he, start, when he gets back from the war in 1945, 46, he starts a political career. And his dad, a very powerful, very wealthy uh, business person who'd been, among other things, US ambassador to the UK uh, during the Roosevelt administration, set up an office for him in New York City that was whole job, simple job was to pay Jack's bills. So he didn't pay for anything as an adult. And, I mean, he didn't take his paycheck. That was sent to charity. Everything just all, you know, so it would be pretty cool, right, to live like that. You just, all your bills just, I mean, in other words, so this is a guy who, who thought, who he had, he had the final Catholic, Roman Catholic rites read to him four times in his life because he was so disabled by his many uh, bouts of various illnesses. So he was always on the edge of death and also immensely privileged. It, it makes for a very complicated set of, of connections. But his father's ambitions for him were particularly important, um, and that has to do with uh, his desire to have the first Irish-American, because they're an Irish-American family, uh, and the first Roman Catholic uh, president be his son. Ideally, that would have been the older son, Joe Jr., the one who got shot down, uh, I mean, who died in a plane crash above the, just off, off the English Channel during World War II. And Jack is the second son and winds up taking his, his place in his dad's imagining. So if any of you have dads you consider sort of pushy, like ambitious for you, I mean, Joe Kennedy was the, sort of that ramped up tenfold. He was a, he was a tough cookie that way. As, as Jack once said to his, somebody who was, I, one of his friends in a little aside, he said, well, you know, we all, we all have fathers. <laughs> you know, he really understood how, how complicated it could be dealing with a dad. Um, but he was, uh, in political terms, he was, uh, to move along here, he was a, a product of his generation. He's a moderate Democrat. That comes out of his family heritage. Uh, his career, uh, he kicks off as it did for everybody who turned 22 in 1939 and was a healthy male in America. He wound up in the war, right, in a generation. This is back when we didn't pay patriotic and working class people to do our war fighting for us as a country. This is back when we had a draft and everybody was expected, including very wealthy, very affluent people, were expected to serve. And he served and had heroic duty in the Pacific where he was the captain of famously PT Boat 109, I'm sure you've heard about. Gets cut in half by a Japanese destroyer. He winds up swimming a few miles, towing uh, by rope uh, uh, some of his, uh, his, the, his crewmates on the ship to uh, uh, nearest island. It was rather extraordinary, especially when you think about his physical condition, which was always quite variable. He comes back, uh, runs for the House of Representatives, spends six years there, and then runs for the Senate in 1952 and, and gets elected t two terms and winds up there for eight years before being uh, ascending to the presidency. He's also Roman Catholic and Irish American. And what that means for our purposes tonight is that he's, he's very sympathetic to people opposed to empires because he knew a little thing about empires, right? All of his Irish relatives hated the British Empire. They didn't always hate British people or even the British flag, but what the Brit Brits had done to Ireland over the generations and decades, centuries, was extraordinary. And uh, 
I'm trying not to look at our distinguished British historian here in front of me who would say a lot more about this than me in all kinds of directions. But, but, uh, but he, he was, he was anti-colonial and this showed up in a very prominent way in 1957 when France is at war trying to crush the Algerian War of Independence and this has become a huge international problem, uh, especially in the midst of the Cold War. And he gets up on the Senate floor and gives this speech saying basically what the Soviets are doing in Hungary is what the French are doing in Algeria. We can't do that. We can't, we can't play both sides of this third world struggle, back to that, that, that sort of line of tension, north, south, and east, west. He says, we got to line it up. We got, if we're going to talk freedom, we got to walk freedom. It's sort of what he's, he's saying here. And so he, he becomes well known here as a voice against col colonialism and therefore in support of national independence in Asia and in Africa. Uh, but he didn't want to go too far. He was a careful, he, he, he said to aides afterwards, after the speech, he said, you know, I need to not be known as the senator from Algeria. All right? He's, he's always trying to be careful, play, play it. And not both sides of it, but be, uh, be ready to be electable and just to remain electable. He uh, also, as a president then in 1961, when he comes into office, he has domestic reforms in mind, right? He's interested in tax cuts. That's how you know he's a moderate Democrat, not a left Democrat. Uh, he's also interested, though, in things like aid to education, uh, health insurance for the elderly, and civil rights reforms. He has a whole package of stuff that's eventually going to get passed to Lyndon Johnson and become the Great Society reforms after Kennedy is assassinated. But what he's really about out is none of that. What he's really about is anti-communism in the international system. He's obsessed with international relations. He doesn't really care that much. What, what, what he says about domestic issues is domestic issues can only lose elections, but foreign policy issues can kill us all. That's how he sees the world. He agreed with Richard Nixon, too, in one private con conversation they had, that the U.S. didn't even need a president for domestic policies, because domestic policies the Senate and the House could do that, but the Congress could do that, because that's just about building outhouses in Peoria. Now, I gave a talk once where I quoted that, and we were in St. Louis when I gave the talk, and I thought, damn, I should have really dug in on that one. So here it is. Here's the, for geography, since I'm here partly honoring my, form, past, my much beloved past uh, father-in-law who was a geographer, you know, just reminding you what an outhouse in Peoria does to people in St. Louis, they actually thought building houses in Peoria would have been a very important issue. They would want the president, because of course the Illinois River flows south. Okay, well, we won't dig into this any further. But I did, I, I wish I'd had that, that slide in St. Louis. There was one exception um, to his lack of interest in domestic uh, politics, and that was the developing crisis in the American South. The, as the civil rights movement encounters an increasing white violent response to it from 1961 to 63. Those are exactly the same years that John Kennedy is in the White House. He does not want to deal with this. He would love not to. It's a problem that gets forced on him. And what he is frustrated with is the priorities. He thinks the civil rights movement is right, but they should calm down, be gradual. The time isn't quite here. He's not as bad as Eisenhower about that, but we have to, pay it to, we have to stay unified because the big struggle is the international struggle against communism. That's the real goal. And if we don't win that struggle, none of this stuff at home will matter. So it's priorities for him. Uh, and, but then he's more frustrated even with the white resistance to the civil rights movement, which becomes increasingly violent and begins to make a mockery of the idea that the U.S. is the, the free world, the heart of the free world, uh, particularly thanks to television cameras in a place like Birmingham, Alabama in the spring of 1963, where the protests are met with spectacular police violence and the use of dogs and, and huge water cannons against children. And then you get full-blown fighting in the streets against the police by working class black Birminghamians who are, who are sick of it. And that, that scares the hell out of the Kennedy administration. They're like, wait a minute, this thing could go. And that's when he finally is gonna, gonna turn and take a different approach to civil rights after, by the summer of 1963. But at the time, in, when the Birmingham riots are going on in the spring of 63, the uh, Organization of African Unity is meeting, it's opening meeting in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And the Ugandan prime minister, here as we're remembering Uganda, here at, at, at Glassboro slash Rowan, um, the Ugandan prime minister, Milton Obote, uh, was warned Kennedy very explicitly in public that the eyes and ears of the world are concentrated on events in Alabama. And the problem here is, unlike the Soviet Union, which didn't have to worry about cameras and news people showing you the insides of gulags and prison camps and, uh, and executions of dissidents, you know, it's the same sort of problems that Putin is solving left and right, as we know. Right, I think, would be the right way to put that politically. But anyway, he's, you know, I mean, so that's sort of, Americans don't have that. The problem with Americans is they're actually it's still a pretty open society, despite all the desire of white Southern resistors 
and not all whites, others resisted the civil rights movement, many of them cheered for it, but the resistance was, you know, had a lot of powerful people in it. They would have liked to turn those news cameras off, and they often tried to, in very, but it was hard to do that. So American race relations wound up in the global arena, to use that subtitle of that one book I wrote about that exact issue. So we have a time, and we have uh, the Cold War, we have a, uh, and, and the end of imperialism. We have a, a person, we've got Jack Kennedy, and we need a place. And the place, of course, is Africa. And in order to understand Jack Kennedy's relationship to the liberation of Africa, we need to remember, first of all, this guy, Nikita Khrushchev, who actually sucks out most of Kennedy's attention. He's the guy who's beating his shoe on the, on the desk at the UN, you know, and, and sort of, quote, sort of ranting about how we will bury you. You know, he seems very threatening because he's very uh, boisterous in his enthusiasm for the Soviet project, this uh, relatively new leader of the Soviet Union, Khrushchev. Uh, and he, he meets Kennedy at the Vienna Summit in, 19, in the spring of 61, just a couple of months into uh, Kennedy's presidency. Uh, and uh, th this, Kennedy perceives this as a really hostile meeting, one in which um, Khrushchev is on the march, Soviets are on the march, we need to stand up to them, we need to slow them down somehow. And this Im immediately leads into crises in three places. One is Berlin, where the Berlin Wall is gonna get built as a way to stop Eastern Germans from fleeing into West Germany before the war wall was there. So that's built in 1961. People often think the Berlin Wall was built in 1945 or during the Berlin Airlift in 1948 or 49. It's a product of the Kennedy years. So Kennedy is managing that crisis, which he's worried could lead to a direct nuclear uh, confrontation. And then the next crisis is in Cuba the next year in 62, which leads to the closest we ever get as a world to a nuclear exchange. We've already had one nuclear war using all the weapons available, two of them against Japan. But a nuclear exchange back and forth, it would have been disastrous for the entire globe, not just for the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that happens in 1962, so Kennedy is, again, totally focused on these issues. And the other crisis is the growing crisis in Vietnam, which is not so much about Khrushchev, as it turns out, and it's mostly going to be Lyndon Johnson's problem. I'm sorry, this is maybe small enough you have a tough time seeing. The number of American troops, that's not going to work. Let's try this. Uh, the number of American troops is really a function of going up here in 1965, 66, 67, 68. This is the height of the war. But if you look down here, if you had really super good vision, you'd see the Kennedy years. And the Kennedy in inherits an American commitment of 800 military advisors to South Vietnam in the struggle against the communist insurgency in the South, assisted by the communist regime in the North. And he inherits 800 in 1961, but he leaves with 16,000 in place. So he, he ramps it. The, the degree of change is higher in the Kennedy years. It's a 20-fold increase than in any other part. This is his, he's very much a part of the ramp up of the war in Vietnam. So those are the distractions that keep him from focusing as much on Africa as he might have liked to. Nonetheless, this is the context in which Africa does present a, a certain challenge and a certain opportunity. And Kennedy inherits here the, among other things, this is, so the 1960 is the year of Africa, as it's known. This is the year when you get 17 independent, new nations become independent in Africa, changes the nature of UN block voting. Uh, this is, I mean, Kennedy is campaigning in the 1960 uh, year during this very context and trying to, trying to work it as a, as a useful issue, especially for black American voters, which he's very good at. He talks about Africa a lot as a nod and a signal to black voters in the US while not alienating quite as many white Southern voters who tend to still vote for the Democratic Party in 1960, right? So he's trying to play both of those camps enough to win the election, which he just barely wins against Richard Nixon. So it, he's in a tough position there and he tries to use Africa but, uh, for this, but it's a, a function, if you think about it this way, of what's going on in Africa is that independence is rolling southward from the um, Arab states in the north through the central states of West Africa, East Africa, and then eventually getting down to the Zambezi River, which is this, uh, you know, the mark where you can sort of see the end of 1964. Uh, down, and in, in Uganda was part of this, this liberation from between 1960 and 1964. It really began in 1957, the first sub-Saharan uh, nation, Ghana, to get its independence um, from a European empire. So this is, this is a, a set of efforts that um, uh, Eisenhower is the first one to really manage because he's the one who deals with Ghana. He's the one who establishes a new Bureau of African Affairs in the State Department. So he's, uh, Eisenhower is not um, particularly friendly toward or sympathetic to Africans. Uh, he's very worried about their, what, what he refers to as premature independence. He and Dulles are always worried about them being prematurely independent. Africans don't tend to like to be told, like nobody, including anybody you know, like to be told when their, that when their demands for independence 
are mature. <laughs> but the term premature was constantly being used. Kennedy's much more enthusiastic about uh, national independence, about self-rule, just as he was more enthusiastic than Eisenhower about racial desegregation at home. But the real problem is that not only is this uh, independence happening, but in addition, resistance is kicking in. And the problem here is, has to do, let me try this one more time, see if, see if my little thing works. Nope, it's not going to. Okay. Um, it, what happens is that the resistance campaigns uh, really dig in in places where you have large percentages of white settlers, right? So this is going to be in Kenya, where the Mau Mau uprising had happened in the mid 1950s. It's going to be in, in uh, um, Belgium, where you have a separatist movement against Belgian independence that's in, through, encouraged by Belgian settlers there. It's also going to be uh, true in Algeria, where you have this enduring, horrific war for eight years from 1954 to 62 of the Algerians against their French colonizers where they have a million French settlers. That's really the problem. But then those are nonetheless all get their independence by 1962. And the real resistance comes uh, instead further south, and that is in S South Africa and its neighboring states. Here you have the, the real crank up of hardline apartheid uh, in, in South Africa, the uh, including the Sharpeville massacre of peaceful protesters where they kill 69 people, and it all winds up on camera. Most of them are shot in the back. This leads the ANC, the African National Congress, famously led by Nelson Mandela, among other people, to establish an armed resistance unit uh, Nkonto Wei Sizwe, which is known as Spear of the Nation. And this young lawyer becomes known above all else as a guerrilla warrior, something he never wanted to be but was driven to doing. And the rest of Southern Africa follows in the same direction, um, with uh, Angola going into revolution against the Portuguese in 1961, against what the, the CIA called the Remember, the CIA is closely allied with Portugal as a NATO ally. They call the Portuguese as having oppressive and medieval practices of the Portuguese in Angola and in Mozambique, where there are a quarter million white settlers as well. And this is also the period, 1962, where you have the election of the first white supremacist regime in Rhodesia, which is going to declare its own independence from, from Britain. So the result is an intensification, if you will, of this conflict, of this challenge for the Americans, right? where we're trying to figure out how to get out of this, um, this dilemma that they're in. And the US response is pretty basic. They talk freedom. They talk anti-apartheid, but in practice, they choose anti-communism over anti-colonialism. Right? When push comes to shove, they, they need Portugal in NATO. They need the Portuguese bases in the Azor Islands. They need Rhodesian uh, chrome for the hardening of metal in, in uh, most forms of modern weaponry, which Rhodesia has in spades. And they want South Africa for a whole variety of, of economic and strategic reasons. Uh, and therefore, they help to the CIA is central to the arrest of Nelson Mandela in 1962 and putting him away for 27 years. The CIA was closely, worked closely hand in hand with the South African <laughs> secret police there. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger, who was a, a close assistant of Jack Kennedy's, put it this way. He said, in uh, trying to summarize this for Robert Kennedy, the president's brother, who was his closest advisor, he said, he said to Robert, he said, the new African nations seek to make us choose between Portugal and South Africa on the one hand and the rest of Africa on the other. We wish to evade that choice. That's what we have to do. We have to evade. We have to avoid taking a, a side here. It's a containment strategy. Trying to con it's not containing communism. It's containing racial conflict. Right? It's trying to keep that first world, third world alliance uh, functioning. You might think of it as sort of the same thing he's doing in the American South. Essentially saying, you know, come on, you protesters and you bigots, keep your eyes on the larger prize of staying unified and defeating communism. Don't get distracted by this thing you have with each other. Right? He's, always, he's always trying to get them out of that. So what you have here instead, he moves to, the, to a sort of symbolic emphasis on um, welcoming um, African diplomats. This is Kennedy's strategy in part, is a PR campaign to make African diplomats newly uh, coming to the US from their new nations, uh, to make them feel welcome as something that he can't do in Africa, he's going to do in the US. Uh, and one of the ways he does this is partly by having them come to, uh, into his office, and he has tons of visitors from Africa come to the White House. But it's largely beca because of these tremendous events of racial discrimination that these new African diplomats encounter when they're trying to get from their UN uh, missions in New York to uh, Washington, DC, where their embassies are, and they stop on the road. Bad idea if you're black, right? Especially once you cross the Delaware Memorial Bridge, and you're no longer in New Jersey, and you're in the old slave-owning states where racial discrimination is still explicit. So you have uh, dozens of examples of people like this um, 
uh, Malik Sow, who's the uh, ambassador for Chad, who are kicked out of restaurants, you know, Howard Johnson's and other things, on Highway 40, on the, you know, once he, they're in Delaware and Maryland on their way into D.C. And so he, he tries to overcome this partly by welcoming them into the White House after they're not welcomed in American institutions. Uh, and, uh, and he's managing a problem that has been developing since the first black ambassadors came in in 1957. They're, uh, resist, they they are, don't get um, restaurant service. They also have trouble getting housing in DC, of course, especially decent housing, because black renters and owners in DC were you know, shunted into ghetto, er, ghettoized areas that were poor conditions. So uh, it, it, he winds up trying to manage that problem. He's going he's gonna to develop a whole campaign almost that, that sort of net go, goes coincides with the Congress, Congress on Racial Equality with their ending racial discrimination along US 40, which of course I've never been able to talk about this with people who know where US 40 is. You know, so it's really fun. It's, it's, here we are, right? It's close by. Um, and it's just, you might think of it as um, the Mason-Dixon line here, which, as you know, runs right through, if they extended it, this part going east to west, if they extended it this way instead of running down the Delaware River, it would go right through Glassboro. In fact, it would go right through Glassboro where my father-in-law used to ride his bike from his house to campus to teach for those 29 years. He crossed the Mason-Dixon line each time, right? So I mean, the Mason-Dixon line was loaded for this, for exactly this purpose. But the other way to think about this is just, I mean, it makes DC look like Berlin, right? Because Berlin, West Berlin, is this city that is um, stuck inside East Germany after the division of Germany in 1945. And there's only two highways out of uh, West Germany across communist East German soil into West Berlin. You could either fly or you could take the two highways, right? And, but if you're African in the US, you actually have exactly the same situation. You have two highways. Uh, Highway 40 and the, and the New Jersey Turnpike, they come down, and you too are going to not be free to get out of your car. They were quite explicit about this. The officials from Mali said that, uh, in, a, in a note of complaint to, to Kennedy, they said, movements of African diplomats assigned to New York and Washington are reduced for these two cities to a corridor constituted by Route 40 and the New Jersey Turnpike, which link the two cities, and their movements are free only if they don't get out of their automobiles. So wait, this is the free world. This is the center of the free world. This is the capital of the free world, right? But, and, and places like Kenya or Tanzania, those are supposed to be hardship posts, right? Where you get double pay if you're a State Department posting there. Now, the hardship post is Washington, D.C., if you're black, right? Or if you're Asian. Or, in other words, it's a really, it turns the whole world upside down. So what do they do? I mean, what, the Kennedy administration, he, kicked, he takes one of his assistants. He's very fond of Pedro San, San Juan. Sends him over to the State Department, creates a new special protocol services section to essentially help with um, gaining, getting housing without humiliation is sort of one of their little taglines <laughs> inside the operation to help people get treated better here. But he recognizes that what's really necessary is a full Civil Rights Act. And this is part of what's moving Kennedy. It's foreign relations that helps move Kennedy to seeing the need for full racial equality. And the other thing they do is establish the Peace Corps, which is a way to tap into American youthful enthusiasm for teaching and engaging with people abroad and curiosity as a way to, to, you know, to, to, get, to sort of signal to the third world good American intentions and the sort of youthful energy and earnestness and, and racial colorblindness of young Americans. That, that's much of what the Peace Corps was about early on. OK, so in sum, how should we evaluate Kennedy's relationship to <laughs> Africa? How should we think about this in the big picture? Uh, you know, he is, again, personally non-racist, at least as much as that was possible for a person at that time in that period, or is ever possible for anybody of any time in any period. He was anti-colonial, and he was youthful, and youthful in the sense that he was still figuring things out. You tend to think of presidents, especially the antique presidents we prefer these days, as being pretty solidly established, regardless of your politics or party, you know, know exactly what they do. They're not changing. Kennedy was still changing, partly because of the volatile times in which he lived. And he moves to, to um, on race, particularly at home, uh, and especially due to these Cold War priorities, he moves to taking a position finally in June uh, of 1963. He gives this major address on the moral issue. He says, we are confronted primarily, first time an American president ever said this publicly, he said, we are confronted with a, primarily with a moral issue about race. It is as old as the scriptures, and it is as clear as the American Constitution. Nobody has said that before. And so, so he's, 
And he also is doing something by symbolically uh, taking Africa seriously and on its own terms from Algeria in 1957 on through until uh, his death six years later. But symbolism isn't just symbolic. Right? I mean, symbolism changes how people think about things. This is why we're in education, you know, because we actually believe if you change people's hearts and minds, you know, it can change how they behave. You know, it, it, isn't, it isn't magic, but it works over time. And that's what he's doing. He's training Americans, especially white Americans, but all non-black Americans, to think about African peoples as peoples. Right? And to see them as individuals and nations and you know, normal folks. With them. And he's really helping that process get along. He's supporting African nationalism, um, where the independence process was already in place in Arab North Africa, as well as in independent uh, uh, South, uh, sort of Central Africa, Sub Saharan Africa. But ultimately, he is restrained by Cold War priorities so that he can't go further than that. As the Pentagon planners put it in 16, 1963, they said Africa, and they really meant Southern Africa, is not an area of primary strategic importance to the US, and we therefore have a strong interest in restricting our involvement there. The NSC put it this way, the National Security Council, about the white-ruled Southern African region. They said in November 63, this is just a week before Kennedy is assassinated, they say, since we can't now bet on a winner in South Africa, Who's really going to win, white folks or black folks in South Africa? Since we can't now bet on a winner, we should be hedging our bets and buying time. Right? This is not leadership. This is fending off a problem, containing a problem because of other priorities. So in conclusion then, with his eyes on the Soviet Union and on Marxist revolutionaries abroad, Kennedy in his brief presidency was eventually persuaded at the very end of his life to actively support racial equality in the white ruled American South. He was convinced to do that at home in a way that he was not yet willing to do in white-led Southern Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.